Professor Jonathan Samet ist Direktor des Instituts für globale Gesundheit an der University of Southern California. Er erhielt verschiedene Preise für sein Wirken. Professor Samet präsentiert die Ergebnisse des Fukushima Reports 2015. 32 Millionen Menschen okay, cool. in Japan sind radioaktiver Strahlung ausgesetzt. Professor Samet zeigt Ihnen nun die Kriterien auf, nach denen der radioaktive Niederschlag infolge des Reaktorunfalls beurteilt wird. Bitte begrüßen Sie Professor Jonathan Samet. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. Actually, I should say good morning because it is now 6 a.m. in Los Angeles, where I, uh, where I live. So I guess I will be awake for my uh, presentation. I'm pleased to be here uh, speaking with you about this important topic and sharing with you some of the work that we have uh, done uh, with uh, Green Cross. There have been many nuclear episodes and at least five major disasters that have had health consequences uh, listed across here, health consequences that reached to the general population. In thinking about the consequences of these uh, disasters, and I think as uh, already um, alluded to, there are acute short-term consequences and longer-term consequences. Acutely, of course, the possibility of high-level exposure and radiation sickness, something experienced by workers immediately uh, in Chernobyl. Uh, also, of course, psychological stress, the stress of being dislocated from one's home, not certain about when return will be possible, if ever. And then, for the long-term, Always the concern about cancer, because we know well that radiation exposure causes cancer, seemingly any exposure increasing cancer risk. But there are other consequences that we've learned. For example, from the atomic bomb survivors, risk for diseases of the heart, cardiovascular disease, and other unexpected consequences. And then, of course, the long-term psychological and social stress. Some experience what in English we would call post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, uh, depression and anxiety are lasting uh, consequences. We're well equipped, uh, based on now uh, decades of experience, to think about what the ca cancer risks are that would come from uh, exposure of the population to radiation from a nuclear disaster. We have what we call risk assessment approaches, We use well-developed tools, models, to understand what the radiation dose is that the population has received. And we have ways to turn those doses into future cancer risk. Much of that information uh, comes on risks from our studies of the uh, atomic bomb survivors in Japan, but now also from other populations. So we use these models, and they're always immediately used in the case of these disasters, Chernobyl, Fukushima, to say how much extra cancer might, they, might there be. And that is important for understanding the burden to the population and the risks sustained by the workers who have had the higher levels of exposure. In a recent article published in the uh, journal Lancet, there was discussion about the issues ranging from the immediate time after a disaster to the longer term, to the initial response, to recovery, to trying to improve the situation, and then to uh, preparedness. For example, in Japan, following the Fukushima incident, there's been much emphasis given now to preparedness, to being ready for what might happen. And as we go from disaster around this circle, We move from monitoring, which you've heard about, to giving iodine to prevent thyroid cancer, to screening, to developing plans, to decontamination, going on still in Fukushima, to medical uh, follow-ups and preparing medical providers to deal with uh, the issues. 
So much uh, is involved, and part of that, uh, what is needed is to understand, in fact, what the risks are. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these uh, two uh, disasters and what, uh, what has been learned from the point of view of uh, health consequences. This will be a very quick uh, review. Of course, uh, with, uh, with Fukushima, there was immediate concern about controlling the disaster and uh, the evacuation of people, but articles pointing to the longer-term consequences. Two years after, Fukushima residents still struggling. Why are they struggling? They've been displaced. The local economy has been damaged. Uh, work is uh, not necessarily available, and people have moved large distances, sometimes separated from their family. Of course, in Chernobyl, the same thing happened, but now more time has passed, and we've learned there about lasting uh, consequences. So looking at uh, Fukushima, one question has been, how many people were uh, exposed in one way or another, and what might the consequences be? When we think about exposure, it should be more than just thinking about radiation exposure, the kinds of extra doses that you've heard about, but the psychological stress, the uncertainty, uh, and the economic consequences, among, uh, among others. So now, looking at uh, Fukushima, there's uh, an important uh, opportunity to learn from what might have happened at Chernobyl, what could have been done better, and to give consideration to the uh, psychological uh, consequences, an area of great interest to Green Cross. So this issue of stress and mental disorders uh, comes up again uh, and again. I think you know the circumstances of the two uh, disasters uh, outlined here, both involving uh, massive and catastrophic failures of uh, the reactors with release of radioactive uh, materials that you've already heard about. For example, cesium I-131, the shorter-lived radioactive isotope that gets into the thyroid gland and can cause thyroid uh, cancer. And in both circumstances, of course, uh, many people uh, displaced uh, for the short term and for the long term, and of course, uh, tremendous uh, costs. There were challenges uh, in both, and I think the challenges that are relevant to understanding the uh, health consequences. The communication of risks that we've heard about already, uh, to the population, mobilizing people to uh, minimize their uh, exposures, evacuations in both circumstances, of course, and in Fukushima, the double tragedy of not only the plant meltdown, but the tsunami just, uh, just before. So in Chernobyl, three decades later, issues of mental and physical health, still the impact of resettlement and the economic uh, burden and uh, ongoing efforts to uh, contain the radiation through, of course, the updated cover to the uh, reactor. And in Fukushima, uh, ongoing uh, management of the uh, situation still. In both situations, of course, the most exposed group, the cleanup workers, the liquidators of Chernobyl, the cleanup workers of um, Fukushima, uh, long-term studies done to look at the cancer risks for the workers, the hundreds of thousands of workers in uh, Chernobyl with some indication of additional risk. And in Japan, a new study is being started of approximately 20,000 of the uh, cleanup uh, workers. That study just getting underway. Our health organizations, WHO and others, have written comprehensive reports many on Chernobyl and uh, reports on Fukushima as uh, well. As I said, cancer is always central, addressed, because we have the tools to make um, estimates. In Chernobyl, we already know that there was excess childhood thyroid uh, cancer. I'll show you in a picture in a moment. Excess cancer in the uh, liquidators, and not clear evidence of increase in some of these other cancers, it would be possible to have small increases that might go undetected because some of our ways of tracking what has happened are not highly sensitive. And then for Fukushima, the story, of course, is, not, is just starting and not over yet. So those estimates have been made of what might happen to extra cancer risk. 
And these models, these tools project that there could be reasonably increased risk for those who are most exposed, particularly exposed when they were uh, in uh, infancy. Now, this is the thyroid cancer story from the Chernobyl disaster, and this is one of the most important immediate consequences. The thyroid cancer occurs because the I-131 enters into the uh, thyroid gland. It, it becomes present in the food chain, uh, reaching the uh, thyroid gland, and the child, the thyroid gland, has rapidly turning over cells. The exposure to radiation can cause cancer. And as you can see, in fact, there was a rather abrupt and quick rise in cancer of the thyroid, not expected to occur so much and so rapidly in Belarus and uh, Ukraine. So this is one uh, topic of great interest in uh, Fukushima. The uh, concern was recognized. Screening has been started on a, a large scale. And there's only very uh, preliminary data to now. It's somewhat difficult to uh, interpret, but thyroid cancers have been found on screening of the children uh, in uh, this area, children uh, and adolescents. This is a plot of the numbers of cases by the age and male and female. This is probably in excess of what there should be. This is a quite uncommon cancer in, uh, in children. Now, so this is the initial screening data. What will be important is what is seen. The screens are planned for every two years, and will there be new cases uh, detected? Early detection is important, and uh, cases found early uh, can, be, uh, can be treated. So hopefully, while excess cancers may occur, screening will prevent uh, deaths of children. This is another effort to use the same data from the screening to say, what are the rates at which new cancer cases are developing per million people? So this would be 359 per million. This is, uh, you've seen the maps already of contamination, sort of more highest in uh, this area approximately. And if you compare, for example, 359 to the number in the least contaminated area here or here, these numbers would appear to be uh, in excess. So the Thyroid cancer screening is going, to be, uh, is going to be critical here. Now, both the WHO reports, Chernobyl and Fukushima, highlighted the importance of the mental health impact, the impact on uh, well-being. And both reports have said the largest public health problem caused by the accident to date. And then here, the psychological impact of the Fukushima accident may outweigh other health consequences. Some of our uh, discussions with people living around uh, Chernobyl certainly bore this, uh, bore this out. Yet, I will say this is probably the consequence of this type of disaster that we are least well prepared to uh, deal with in spite of the large numbers of people uh, affected. Uh, in our work now going on for six or seven years, uh, collaborating with uh, Green Cross, we tried to um, understand to the best we can what is in the scientific literature, what is published, and how much do we know about these problems. Uh, we've published uh, these reports related to uh, the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, these are available through the uh, Green Cross uh, website. The work has involved uh, not only reviewing of the literature, but uh, in collaboration with colleagues from the uh, region, carrying out discussions, focus group discussions, where there were guided uh, discussions with people affected by the disaster about what had happened to them, what, how their lives had been affected 25 plus years on from the, uh, from the disaster. And I think what came through was that there were clear effects on mental health and uh, well-being, concerns about the economy, concerns by parents about uh, their children. Uh, and an interest and in desire to have the adequate medical services and interventions. And then, of course, the issue of being stigmatized, of being exposed to radiation 
and what that might mean for future health. Of course, all parents are concerned about their children. Now, in uh, Chernobyl, uh, many people were exposed to radiation. And of course, these radiation plumes do reach worldwide, highly uh, diluted. Uh, estimates, adding up various estimates of people exposed and where the radiation tracked would lead to about 10 million people uh, there. Uh, more recently, uh, just a, about a year ago, we uh, put together the literature on the uh, Fukushima uh, disaster and attempted to make an estimate uh, from this map, which you've already seen, of how many people might have been uh, exposed. Uh, what we did was simply take the populations underlying this uh, plume of radioactivity and add them up. And uh, that number comes out to be as high as 32 million, counting, of course, the fact that uh, the radiation plume reached to parts of uh, Tokyo, which is, of course, an, an enormous city. There have been estimates of deaths uh, related to the accident, of course, very difficult to track, but with the stress of the dual disasters, disruption of medical services and so on, there are estimates of around 2,000 people. The 160,000 people uh, evacuated. The estimates, and again, these are estimates based on our tools, we have to see what happened, uh, are that future cancer risk uh, is relatively low, but may be high for some, higher for some subgroups. And then, of course, uh, discuss the psychological and uh, non-cancer uh, consequences. So we are only uh, at the start of what may be um, an exposure, an exposure to stress, not only radiation, but stress that may have substantial and lasting uh, consequences. So I'm going to end here and tell you that uh, there's a great deal of information uh, included uh, in these uh, reports. And I think what is important now is that the work of uh, tracking and providing the needed services to those affected uh, continue. Thank you.